Thank you very much. I would like to first uh, thank President Walker and by extension, Dr. Adriel Hilton and other staff at Upper Iowa for organizing such a wonderful event. At the same time, for the invitation to speak to you today. Let me take a moment, though, to say that uh, in the event that you didn't know, uh, you have a committed and nationally respected higher education leader in Dr. Dr. Adriel Hilton. And I'm certain that the institution will continue to appreciate your presence. The great state of Iowa has a special place in my heart. It was where I was introduced to Midwestern values. It was also where I was introduced to the cold weather <laughs> and snow. Fourteen years ago, I moved from Auburn, Alabama, to Ames, Iowa to a PhD degree. And it remains one of the best decisions that I've made to date. It was the education, the experience, but mostly uh, the people that significantly shaped my life in such a way that I could enjoy both personal and professional success. And I have no doubt that this fine institution changed lives in the same way. There's a historical irony why I selected Iowa State University. It was Iowa State's best known graduate that sealed the deal for me. This was an institution that gave birth to one of the greatest scientists of all time, who happened to be African American, George Washington Carver. Carver was propositioned by Dr. Frederick D. Patterson, uh, the president of Tuskegee Institute, who is also another Iowa State graduate, to come work at his institution. And in considering the decision, Carver posed this question. Where will I do the most good for my people? The answer to his question took him to Tuskegee. When I completed Iowa State, when considering job opportunities, I posed the very same question. The result for me took me to the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Because at the time, my current department, in all of its years of existence, had never had an African American faculty member. I figured that if it took that long to find someone that they would hire, that if I did not take the job, it might take equally as long for it to happen once again. It had been a great. It has been a great experience, uh, filled with growth for me and my department over the last four and eleven years. And for those of you who are not from the South, the irony of the Carver connection is that Tuskegee is approximately fifteen minutes from Auburn, and our decision took us on the same travel path, but in opposite directions, but for the same reason to do good for our people. But this is not a car celebration. This is a Martin Luther King celebration. While I want to get to the celebration part, I also want to bring attention to the fact that Dr. Martin Luther King was not always celebrated. Prior to his death, both whites and blacks had mixed and divided feelings about King. There were many members in both that did not want him messing with the current social order. Many enjoyed the lives that they had developed and wanted to continue living them the way they had. So sometimes we forget that these mixed and divided feelings led to his death by murder. He argued for the appreciation and difference by race, gender, and religion, but also for the appreciation for those many talents, many talents possessed by those individuals, and appreciation for them, and what those talents can do to improve the overall life experiences that we can have here in the United States. I bring this up because higher education is an employment industry 
does, does, that does not always appreciate its most committed members, regardless of the aforementioned characteristics. It is in many ways designed to take those that commit to an institution for granted and to reward those that other institutions have deemed important. Namely, sometimes your true value is not recognized until there is the possibility that another institution will lure you away. I hope we learn from the King experience and value and appreciate the people who have been doing good works while we have them and not only take note once we're about to lose them. The comments I want to share with you today will be based, for the most part, on the content of one of my books, Strengthening the African American Educational Pipeline. Uh, it is a comprehensive book that considers the African American involvement in education from spanning from kindergarten to our participation as college presidents, and also includes chapters that deal with the role of family parents, and community for improving experiences of children in schools. The title of today's speech is The Role of Education in Fulfilling His Dream. For the students of color in the audience and those who are visiting through live stream, you may ask why is this question or topic important? I plan to be a doctor, a lawyer, and or an engineer. Why should I care about the educational system? Here's why. Our ancestors understood the power of education as a tool for equity and advancement, upward mobility. That's why they fought so hard for access to education. Let's remember that these ancestors bled and died for the right to simply be educated. Let's remember that slaves were killed and or shot on the spot if they could read or write. They understood, as well as those, as those denying the rights, that education, that it was a tool for upward mobility in society. They understood that an educated people was a liberated people. But related to the title of this speech, and topic. Education represents the promise of the American dream, very much so aligned with what Dr. Martin Luther King spread. America was built on a premise that regardless of your social background, that with the proper education and opportunity, you could do almost anything you chose to do. Individuals from other countries come to America every day and cash in on this American dream. Have we cashed in on the American dream in similar ways? While others weeping the benefits of the American dream that the blood of our ancestors pays for, what will this generation contribute to the fight for educational equity? Before I get to my remarks, I want to share a story with you that provides a classic description of the struggle of African Americans in education. In a rural town in the deep south, a baby boy was born to a single mother. The mother married the father of this baby boy a year later. The baby boy was the ring bearer at the wedding. The father had joined the army and was away from basic and return for the wedding. One of the best things that father could have done was join the army to move his new family to a place that offered and afforded more prosperity. You see, this rural town in which this baby boy was born had no opportunities for advancement. The school districts were horrible, and students were graduating without the ability to read and write. Fortunately for this baby boy, he would get to go to schools on the army base, which were quite good. Unlike his cousin of the same age who remained and grew up in this rural town and attended these schools, this young man's cousin turned to the only hope of prosperity 
in this rural town, the streets. The hardworking folks in this town and community had nothing to show for their hard work but agony and pain. The streets offered a lot of money, fancy clothes, and car. This young man's cousin became a drug dealer, a dope dealer, or as you might say today, a trap star. He got exactly what the streets promised. He got the money, and he got those clothes, but he also got prison. Prison exactly where this young man might have also been if it not had been for his father who had joined the army. Unlike his cousin, this young man grew up in the third largest city in this state and received an excellent education. However, when he reached middle school and it was time to choose diploma tracks because they were still officially tracking students at the time, this relatively smart young man selected the highest diploma track. The teacher immediately scheduled a parent-teacher conference with his mother. The teacher informed the mother that not only will your son not be able to receive this elite diploma that he selected, but he will not graduate high school. This young man, this was a little unusual because this young man had did fairly well in school. The young man was at a crossroads. He could acquiesce to what the teacher said, or he could prove her wrong. Imagine what hearing this does to the psyche of young black children. <coughs> it can be damaging. And indeed, it damages the dreams of young black children every day. Fortunately for this young man, that day marked a psychological and educational transformation into what he deemed to be a top premier student. He used this opportunity to reshape his thoughts and views about education and its importance. He realized that he needed to take his educational <coughs> process very, very seriously because the only person that cared about his success was going to be him. This young man indeed did get that elite college prep diploma. He went to college and earned his bachelor's degree and then a master's degree and then a PhD degree, and then most recently promoted to full professor, effective fall 2011, and stands here before you today. I tell you this story, not for accolades or credit, but to share with you what shaped my commitment to education. What drives me to be so compassionate about the predicament of underrepresented groups in education and what drove me to become an academic? I could have easily ended up a bad statistic opposed to a good statistic. But it also shows that King's dream can be fulfilled in many ways. And his dream included us all having equal access to obtaining our individual dreams through a better life and prosperity. To understand the present conditions of African Americans in education, we must consider history. African Americans have a strong ancestral lineage. What other group could have survived slavery, segregation, Jim Crow? African Americans have been treated like animals in the United States, but held the pride of their community like the kings and queens they were in Africa? What other group could have been denied education for approximately 300 years, but remained functional and competitive in society? Slaves taught themselves how to read and write. Think of how intelligent these slaves were. They could teach each other a foreign language with no guidance. Some even mastered the language to the degree that they became writers, like Phyllis So ponder this, while many have you to believe that African Americans are intellectually inferior, I question that notion. Here's why. They were legally denied education, but they became inventors, engineers, businessmen and women, doctors, and so on. 
Moreover, they are presently competitive with the best and brightest in America today. What does that mean? It is the equivalent of letting person A start running a foot race today. And 300 years later, permitting person B to start in that same race. All of this significant gap in time, resources, and quality of training and equipment, person B has caught up with person A. Think how superior an athlete that would be that could make up that much distance and be able to compete after a 300 year head start. Research in my book shows that African Americans' participation in education was the strongest prior to desegregation. African Americans lost a strong education system with desegregation. Prior to desegregation, African Americans had their own schools. These schools included highly qualified and competent teachers and administrators, all African American. <laughs> if you examine early data from the United States, National Center for Educational Statistics, you will see that these individuals are more qualified than their white counterparts. At the time, the best and brightest became teachers and administrators because those were the prestigious and rewarding jobs. African Americans were not permitted to go into other fields as they can choose now. Therefore, the best worked in the schools. When your best are working in the schools, the result becomes high quality education, in this case, for African American students. When desegregation occurred, nearly all the African American teachers and administrators were displaced because it was assumed that white teachers and administrators were better qualified to work in the desegregated schools. Therefore, African Americans have relied heavily on other groups to train and nurture their students. And this is presently the case. Most depressingly, most depressingly, the best and brightest of African-American community do not choose education as a profession anymore. And we lose out on those talents with our children. And going back to the title, because I was asked not to talk too long tonight by Dr. Hilton, because uh, I think he understood that I normally teach on Mondays. And I teach from 4.49 to 9.45. <laughs> and so, I am used to talking for almost six hours, two classes back to back. Uh, so I put my remarks on paper, not for me, but for you. <laughs> to rein myself in, because sometimes if it gets really good, <laughs> it could be 9.45. <laughs> and I still don't get everything out that I want to say. But I'm going to close. And going back to the title, role of education for filling these dreams. How will you enact your dream in this room? You started on a process with your first program. The question is how will you enact this dream? The reality is that we must accept ownership for our individual desire to succeed in education and in life. Further, we must all take an individual stand to improve the educational system for all, if not for us, but for those who come behind us. Otherwise, others did it for us, and their death will go in vain, and their hard work will go in vain, and we would not be taking advantage of the opportunities presented before us. What opportunities will we make for those that come behind us? Will we be known as a generation that did nothing to address the education, equity, or gap? I don't know about you, but I choose to follow his dream and make a difference. Thank you. <laughs>